Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 23 of the True Crime All the Time Unsolved podcast. I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me, as always, is my partner in true crime, Mike Gibson. Gibby, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing really good, man. That's good to hear it. I like it when you're doing good. I know. You always say you're doing good. I don't know what I would do if you said, man, I'm I'm not doing good. uh, Not a good day today, man. Uh, In a real uh, low voice. Yeah. All right, Gibbs, we've got to get into Charlie Chopoff. And it's an interesting name, and it's kind of right on the mark. Spot on. It's not too hard to figure out what uh, what we're going to be talking about here. And, you know, this is an unsolved case that I think you've had on your list for quite a while, pretty much from the beginning when we started Unsolved. But it is a case that there's not a lot of information out there on. So this episode may not be quite as long as some of our other ones, but it's interesting nonetheless, and we wanted to tell it. If you're out there on the internet, you realize that this is one of the top unsolved cases that pops up. It does. It pops up on a lot of lists of unsolved cases, but like some of the unsolved cases we start down, there are a lot of them, Gibbs, where you're just struggling to put together the information. Right. It is a real research fest, especially on these older ones. Right. Yeah. Because we're we're talking early 70s. I mean, Gibbs probably was about 30 years old, so he probably knows it a little bit more (laughs) than I do. (laughs) I just make you older and older. I'm 90 years old in every episode. (laughs) I was just being born. Gibbs was on his fourth marriage. Yeah. So between 1972 and 1974, the bodies of five young black and Puerto Rican boys were discovered in Manhattan, New York, and then another boy was assaulted and left for dead, but he didn't die. Now, each of the victims were either stabbed or slashed or some combination of both, but what they all had in common that I think Gibbs probably causes this case to make those lists that we were talking about, you know, the top 10 most famous unsolved or the most haunting or whatever you want to call it, is that each of these kids had their genitals either mutilated or in a lot of cases, they were completely removed. And this is where the crude... I mean, you have to say it's crude, right? Oh, absolutely. The crude nickname of the unknown perpetrator comes in, Charlie Chopoff. I I almost hate saying it. It's so crude. But this is what what it's known as. Now, we're talking, we're going on 40-some years, right, Gibbs, from when this happened. And these files officially are still open, right? These are still unsolved. I mean, they got to be a little cold, But they're still open today, even though, as we're going to go through, there are a number of suspects and one in particular that was even arrested. But obviously, since this is an unsolved case, we know this person was not convicted. But we're going to talk about all that as we get into it. But as we like to do, let's start off focusing on the victims. It's kind of a hallmark of what we do, Gibbs. And I first want to talk about Douglas Owens. He was only eight years old. And this is going to be a theme. These were young kids. And Douglas Owens was African-American. And he was actually the first victim. And his body was discovered March 4th, 1972. And Douglas went missing on a rainy day while he was running some errands. His body was discovered just a few blocks from his home, and it was actually discovered on a rooftop of a building in Harlem on East 121st Street. Now, we got to talk about the way he was found, Gibbs, because, I mean, it's brutal. There's no way around it. This case is brutal. Douglas Owens was stabbed 38 times in the neck, in the chest, and back. His genitals were cut so severely that they were, it was almost completely severed. 
but not quite completely, right? And that and that's something that I want to talk about. Why? Why cut some of the genitals off completely and cut other ones so severely but leave them still attached? Yeah, so was it because the knife didn't do the job he wanted? Was he rushed and couldn't finish? I think the knife would do the job. And the reason why I say that is because in the research, at least with Douglas Owens, it made it sound like it was so complete that it was, you know, the genitals were barely hanging on by almost like skin. So it wouldn't have taken hardly anything to complete that. No. So it's almost like either there was a reason or like you said, there was some type of interruption that made the the killer leave or stop prematurely. Yeah, I st- and I, I have a hard time thinking about the fact that the suspect had to stab the the, the little kid thirty eight times, thirty eight times. Well, he didn't have to. No, well, no, no. But I, I, I'm I'm piggybacking off of what you're saying because to me that is overkill. Yeah, you know, I mean this is. I mean, how much rage can that possibly be that you could not stop for 38 strikes? Yeah, that's that's what I wanted to piggyback off of what you were saying, because, you know, a much lower number would have killed an eight year old boy. There's no doubt about that. We know that. So to make it 38 times, you're either getting into the area of, like you said, rage or if there's a sexual component to this, then, you know, you and I have covered cases where, and we've heard from the killer's own mouth that every time they struck a blow or every time the knife penetrated, that was very sexual to them. Well, then I can see that in this case then. Right. Because it, does that explain why it's 38 times? It's got to be it's got to be something like that. It's either rage and you're getting that rage out or it's sexual gratification and that's why the number is so high because it's unnecessary as as it relates to killing the person. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Now there was evidence of sexual assault, Gib. So I mean, I think that's kind of why I was heading down that path. But you can talk about two different types of sexual gratification, right? I almost put it in two, two different buckets. There's the sexual gratification from what we think of as a sexual assault. And then there's sexual gratification from what I think of as really no sexual contact at all. But the, the murder itself is somehow sexualized and the perpetrator gets gratification from that. And that's where I was talking about, you know, every plunge of the knife is almost orgasmic. It's a lustful event for him. Right. It's a lust, a lustful thing. You're right. It's hard to imagine that for me. I mean, I shouldn't say that everything we talk about is hard to imagine. Right. To me, but actually deriving pleasure from sticking the knife in, I just, I don't even see how that's possible, but we know from all the research we've done that there are a lot of killers that have said that's how they got off. Yeah. Right away. Her Baumeister comes to mind for me. Well, yeah, but his was strangulation. But yeah, still he got into that, you know, right. It wasn't like actual physical sexual contact. Is, is is what I would think of. He really got off on the compression, the str- the the manual strangulation, the seeing the life like tummy Lynn cells, seeing the life go out of their mm-hmm. eyes. Now Gibbs, there was some stuff that came out from the police that they had a theory that this was a very personal killing. Now, if that is true, then to me that that could go either way, right? Then you can get into rage if you were upset at at this person or you felt like, now again, we're talking about an eight-year-old kid. 
And I'm not sure what this eight year old boy could have done to somebody to elicit that kind of rage. But one interesting fact was, you know, a few weeks after this murder or a few weeks after the body was found, I should say, there was an anonymous call that came into the police and this anonymous caller actually named a local man as a suspect to the killing. So police, they wanted to interview this suspect, but they couldn't find him. So what they had to do, what they were left with is interviewing the suspect's relatives that were local to the area. And they said they hadn't seen him in months. So really not much came of this tip. They pursued it a little bit, but I mean, how far could they go? Now, what would come out later that the police did not know at this time is that this man, this that was labeled as a suspect by an anonymous caller, he was actually admitted to a local mental hospital on March 7th. Now, that's three days after this body was discovered. And the reason that it said that he was admitted was that he had become very violent and was having these unbelievable delusions. So in the very next month, we're in April, and this is when an unnamed victim, 10-year-old African-American boy, and again, not named in the press because he, he was not killed. This is the the person that we talked about, he was left for dead in the hallway of an apartment building, but he was not murdered. No. And like the first victim, he was uh, attacked on a rainy day while he was out running errands. And that that's a weird tie-in. Yeah. Now, I kind of think, I'm just kind of thinking about the time, the location, probably fairly common for the young boys or just kids in the family to go out of the apartment in Harlem or whatever neighborhood they grew up in and go to the corner market and get something to come back. I don't think there's any doubt about that, that back in the seventies, it was much easier for a parent to say to their kid, run down to the corner market and get me some milk right today. You and I would never let our kids do do that. You know, especially when you're talking eight years old, 10 years old, but today is different than 19, early 1970s. Now this is Harlem. It is New York. I don't know the difference, but I can only speak to where we live, which is a much different place. Yeah. But I mean, this is this, you know, this is a Harlem. It's, a, you know, the Bronx, whatever you have your boroughs and you have your very tight communities with grocery stores on each corner. And I still think you're right. I I don't think it would have been that strange Mm -hmm. for a parent to ask a kid, especially if it was raining. Hey, I I don't want to go out. Yeah. Run down to the store and get us some milk. Here's a buck. Go get us what we need. Yep. No, I I, I like the way you're thinking, but I still think it's strange because I think that would have happened a lot. So the fact that both of these kids were attacked on a rainy day while running errands, a very specific connection well and it's it makes the child an easy target because there's no adult most likely no friend right so it's an easy target whatever whatever the ruse was you know if it was to offer something to the kid or yeah and that's the one thing we cannot know because that's the type of stuff you usually find out after the killer is apprehended and they start telling their story There's a lot of theories, but you know. So this 10 year old boy, he was sexually assaulted. He was stabbed in the neck and back and gives it said that he was gutted. And in addition to that, his genitals were removed. I mean, this sounds like an absolute nightmare. And this kid survived this. Now, when they found him, his shoes were removed. And thinking logically gives, what is the reason for his shoes to be off? Now, there's a, there's a lot of reasons. It could be the shoes can fly off during a scuffle. But I think the one that I'm leaning towards, and we didn't mention it, 
But Douglas Owens, the first boy, I forgot to mention, his shoes were removed as well. And I'm leaning towards the fact that the removal of the shoes was due to the sexual assault. Now, Gibbs, there is some really strange things that come out of this one. First off, the perpetrator takes the boy's genitals with him, right? And we're assuming it's a man, as I always do, but took the genitals as he left the scene. So like we said, I mean, this boy survived, but you have to think about how much trauma he went through in this attack. And because of that, he wasn't able to give much of a description to the police of his attacker. Yeah, he's pretty vague about it. I mean, he just said basically he thought it was either a Spanish or an Italian person and that the suspect had a mole on his cheek. And for some reason, he used the name Michael. And that and that's strange to me, because if you're going to attack somebody, you're not going to. Tell, well, you might give him a name, but it surely wouldn't be your real name. So I wouldn't think the police thought that had any solid connection, right? I mean, knowing why would they give the real name? But the interesting thing was the way that he got the boy to him was to offer him 50 cents. You know, come here, I got 50 cents if you'd like to have it. Which I'm guessing back in 72, 50 cents was a lot of... You're guessing? You lived through it. <laughs> Yeah, so you have to I was going through my fourth marriage. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> and no, I'm thinking fifty cents was you know well, it was a hell of pretty... a lot more than it is today. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, if a phone call, phone booth phone call was ten cents, you know, fifty cents that's that's a good chunk chunk of change. But the most bizarre thing about this whole incident, Gibbs, is that they later find this boy's genitals, and I don't know how many times I'm going to have to say the word genitals in this episode. But I have a feeling it's a lot. Oh, yeah. But they find I, they find this in a park, and there's a group of children playing with it. Which is bizarre. No, it is. And I, I don't know if they knew what it was or why would they be playing with it. But they were. So let me ask you this. So can you imagine this really courageous boy survives, right? Can you imagine growing up and not having that specific body part? Yeah. No, but I can't believe he survived. I, yeah, I can't believe either after being gutted and having that removed. I just couldn't. That alone, I just couldn't. I can't even fathom. But See, I always thought, and maybe this is just a, one of those tales that you hear, I always thought if you lose, if that part of your body gets cut off, that you lose so much blood pretty quickly that without immediate help, you would bleed out. I don't know why, but I, I always just thought that. But, I mean, there are some famous cases, right? John Wayne Bobbitt. Yep. It happened to him. But I don't know how fast he got immediate, you know, he immediate got attention. attention. And, and I also don't know how quickly they discovered this boy and they were able to administer help either. Yeah. So you mentioned that the information on the suspect was very vague, but they did have a police artist do a sketch. But the one thing that I think came about Gibbs is right. So this is a second young boy in as many months attacked in the same way, same neighborhood. And you know, it's the same person because of the similarities in these two attacks. So you have to know that this neighborhood is going nuts over this because number one, it's children. And you and I always talk about that. There's nothing that gets people fired up more than children or people hurting children. So Gibbs, we have to go back and talk about the main suspect in the first murder. And we talked about how he had been admitted to a local mental hospital just days after that murder occurred. Now, later, police would find out that this same man had left the mental hospital during the period of time when this attack happened. That can't be a coincidence. Yeah, I don't think so. Now, it was a little unclear whether he had permission to leave or whether he slipped out, but he did return to the hospital and was discharged on April 23rd. As part of the discharge, 
he was supposed to report periodically back into the hospital, but he didn't. He never did. And eventually the hospital lost contact with him. Yeah. Which that's a scary thing. That's a real scary thing. Because I'm really not sure why he was discharged. Maybe they couldn't hold him because everything that I read Gibbs said that he was, he was in some kind of psychotic state. That's the way it was described. So why would they release somebody like that unless they had no grounds to hold him? That's the only thing I can think of. So the next attack Gibbs happens in October. So the first two were kind of back to back in consecutive months. Now we're jumping up to October and this is Wendell Hubbard. He was nine years old, African-American, and he vanished while playing near his home. And this was around 5.30 in the afternoon. He lived in East Harlem. And his mother realized when she tried to call him inside that he wasn't coming. He wasn't answering. He was nowhere to be found. So she reported him missing. And it wasn't very long. I mean, a number of hours after this that three boys playing on the roof of an apartment building, they would come across the body of Wendell Hubbard and they knew right away that he was dead. So they go get police. And the other thing is, I mean, this is only about six blocks from where Douglas Owens had been found. Yeah. The first victim. So small, we're talking small radius here. Absolutely. In this neighborhood. Now, Wendell had been stabbed 17 times in the abdomen, the neck and chest. And again, he had been sexually assaulted as well. And just like the victim before that survived, his genitals were also completely removed and had been taken away by the killer. So do we think that the reason the killer has taken the genitals trophy? I don't know why else you would. And that he just dropped the one in the park trying to get away when he was fleeing the scene. Otherwise, he would have kept them or, man, who knows? I I can't think of any reason to take that. I mean, you're not taking it to get rid of evidence. You're not taking it. The only reason would be that you're going to use that later on to relive this sexual Mm -hmm. part of what you did. Right. Kind of like the Chicago Ripper Club keeping the women's breast. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. Now, it's sick. Is all get out. Oh, absolutely. That's the only sense I can make of it. So Gibbs, I mean, you know, the police are combing for evidence at these crime scenes. And especially with this Wendell Hubbard murder, they didn't find any fingerprints, which that, that one doesn't surprise me as much. What surprises me is that they didn't find any bloody footprints. And you would think that there would be a, significant amount of blood because this is a what this person is doing is they're doing it very close up right you'd have to be very close to the body and as soon as you did that you would think there would be spurt there would be blood loss well especially you know some of these victims 17 times 38 times stabbed and then on top of that like you said oh you're right you know removing the Genitals. I was thinking about removing the genitals, but I mean, you're even bringing up a better point, which is there's all these stab wounds that are creating what you would think would be pools of blood. Yeah. How is this killer not getting anything on? Now, I'm not saying they don't get anything on them, but they're not getting anything on their shoes. And how is no one seeing this person fleeing the scene with some type of blood on him, you know, especially if he's sexually assaulting, you know, if he's up close while he's stabbing, I don't know, but I don't know how he gets in and out without having any type of blood transfer that people would like kind of see, you know, this is New York, Harlem. I'm sure there's a lot of people out on the streets. And we're not talking midnight, pitch dark, two o'clock in the morning. No. So what does he wear that he can hide this? I don't know, but it's mysterious. It is mysterious. Well, that's why it's unsolved. It is why it's unsolved. 
So we have to move forward. And the next victim is Luis Ortiz. He was also nine years old. And Luis had, was the youngest of five. He went missing in March of 1973. So we're into 73 now. And kind of like what we talked about, you know, he had gone down to the corner store. He had bought some milk. He bought some bread. And this was around 7, 8 o'clock at night. And he never made it home. Now, Luis, you know, we mentioned that some of the boys were African-American. There was one boy that was Puerto Rican. And this is Luis. He was Puerto Rican and he was the only victim that was not African-American. But what I read Gibbs, I want to see what you make of this, that it, it said that Luis was very dark skinned. Yeah. So he probably had, you know, just had the appearance to be like any other kid in the neighborhood. No, what I was getting at was, I, I guess what I was getting at was, was this killer targeting specifically African-American boys and thought this was an African-American boy. thought Luis, who was described as dark skinned, was African-American. That would easily be. I, I'm just. You could, that could you could easily do that. I'm just throwing that out there because. Yes. That's a part of this story, right? There's there's he didn't kill three African-American, one Latino, one Caucasian. I think this killer was targeting African-American boys. I and, agree. And I believe, and I'm, I'm making a leap here, but I believe from the fact that they talked about how Luis was dark skin, you know, his skin was very dark, that the killer may have mistaken him as being African-American. That's what I believe. Now, Luis was stabbed 38 times back, neck, chest, and his genitals were also removed and taken. So again, there's no doubt, Gibbs, that these are all connected, right? I mean, same neighborhood, same area, multiple, multiple stab wounds, removal of the genitals. You're not going to, you just don't see that all the time. And the age ranges. Yeah, it all lines up for me. Oh, there's not a doubt in the world that these are all connected. I don't even think you could make the argument that these are Anything but one serial killer, everything just too close. Yeah, I agree. Now, in this case, they did have multiple witnesses that saw the person. And because of that, they were able to develop a composite sketch. Yeah, and because of that sketch, the police, they were able to go door to door very heavily throughout the neighborhood, right? To try to get any additional information from the people in the neighborhood. Which is a good thing because I like to hear that because it makes me think that the police were working this hard. And you know they had to be. And the reason why is because there would have been an unbelievable outcry from the neighborhood to the police saying, Hey, what in the hell are you guys doing to catch this person? He's killing our kids. Yeah, and so the good thing was because all the canvassing that they did they were able to get about 300 tips to look into. And Gibbs, the Ortiz family was so rocked by this murder. They left New York very shortly after and went back to Puerto Rico. Again, we have to get back to this main suspect, the person that we're calling the main suspect, because just about a month after the murder of Luis Ortiz, this person is once again committed to a state hospital for what was called uncontrollable violent outbursts. And this is very important as, as we go along, because we're going to get into more about the suspect and other suspects. Now, the last victim that we have to talk about, his name was Stephen Cropper, eight years old. He was African-American. Now, Stephen was discovered in August of 1973. So this is about five months after the last murder. But there are some differences with this one. Now, Stephen was slashed with a razor blade. He wasn't stabbed multiple times with a knife like all the other boys. And there was no mutilation of his genitals. So 
just like you and I talked about Gibbs, how much all the other ones lined up, this one didn't line up the same way. But it's kind of put into as being possibly connected. Sure. I say that. Yeah, I agree. Well, just like the other ones, his shoes were removed. And for whatever reason, he was placed in a very sexual position. I think what they thought, there was some indication of sexual assault. Yeah. So that part lines up. The shoes lines up. Just the actual way he was murdered and the the genital mutilation kind of separates it from the others. One reason why I think it is grouped together is because the police thought they just thought it had to be the same killer. It was, it was too probably inconceivable to them to think there were, there was more than one person killing young boys like this in this manner, operating in the same place at the same time. That was probably just too much for them to wrap their heads around. Yeah. And I could see it being the same killer. I mean, he could have used a different weapon and maybe he didn't get to the point where he would normally would have removed the genitals, right? Because maybe something came along that spooked him. Something happened that he, or just the fact that you know, maybe he changed his MO, but I think maybe he got spooked. Yeah. It, there's definitely a case can be made for that. You know, the other thing I was thinking is, Maybe for whatever reason, Gibbs, he didn't have a knife. What he had was a razor blade. You can't really stab with the razor blade, right? It's a slashing type weapon. Now, I do think you could remove genitals with the razor blade. So that probably goes back to your point of, was he, if it is the same person, was he planning to, but he got spooked? Again, we're talking about, this is inside of a tenement house. It's not like, Somebody couldn't come walking along. Yeah. And it could have been the fact, like you mentioned earlier, the gratification they got by stabbing, right? The turn on. So if he couldn't stab and he can only slash and there really wasn't nothing to it that really got him, got him off. So maybe he's like, yeah, okay, I'm done with this one. I'm going to move on. I wish I had my knife. Nope. All, everything you're saying could hold water. But as you can imagine at this point, the whole community is in just a state of panic. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else to say it. Now they develop a task force. And this is one thing I don't understand Gibbs. Why would it take so long to develop a task force? I mean, you would have known after the second, okay, I'll say the third victim that you've got some type of serial killer on your hands. This is almost, when Stephen Cropper is murdered, that's almost a year after the third victim. Yeah, it really wasn't until the fourth victim that they started canvassing the neighborhoods with the sketch where they got the 300 tips. It does seem like it took a little while to do... That would have been a good time to have the task force. Shouldn't have taken that long to form a task force. You know you have a serial killer on your hands at least a year, if not earlier. Yeah, I would have thought after that. the second one, you would have said, we need to do something. Yeah, same same person is out doing this. And it was said that the task force interviewed over 150 suspects. And this is when it was said, Gibbs, the local children began referring to this unknown killer as Charlie Chopoff. And the name stuck. Sure. And he's been called that ever since. I mean, we're 40 some years down the road and this killer is still known as Charlie Chopoff. All right, Gibbs. So can we get into some suspects? Let's get into it. We've talked about all the victims. We've got to talk about some of the suspects. Like we said, there was over 150 that were interviewed. And after the murder of Stephen Cropper, this is when they have the task force. There was a suspect that was apprehended, arrested, and actually named in the press, right? His last name was Gonzalez. The problem is is that when the police pulled in the witnesses, they were not able to confirm that this was the man that they had seen. So the police knew they had to let this guy go, but they couldn't let him go. 
And the reason why they couldn't let him go was that there was a mob that formed around the station. And I can see that, right? I mean, all these terrible things that happened to these kids, these young kids, grotesque things, right? Now you've, you've, you've heard through the grapevine. They've got the guy. They're at the police station. It's like the old days, man, when you got the posse together. You went there and you demanded the sheriff to turn the guy over to the posse so we could take care of business the old, the old way. No, I agree. They could not, they would have killed this guy. This mob would have ripped this guy limb from limb. I agree. They would have. So the only thing the police could do and what they ended up doing is sneaking this Gonzalez guy out of the station and they had to dress him up as a police officer. That's the only way they could get him out. So using this kind of sneak tactic, they were able to get this man out and the mob died down. But, you know, there was reports, Gibbs, there was a man that people thought looked like the suspect and they, they chased him. I mean, there was, you have to imagine there was all kinds of things going on. A few weeks after the Stephen Cropper murder, there was another man, uh, last name Olivo, and this man was charged with molesting a five-year-old boy. He had lured him into a near, uh, you know, a secluded area of a park. The boy got away, got to his father, and they got the police, and they discovered this Olivo character hiding in some bushes, and they arrested him. Now, a couple of things. He did fit the suspect's profile. Skin tone. He had a limp, which I believe some of the witnesses may have said about the suspect. The problem with the Levo is when the police started looking into him and his movements around the time of the murders, they didn't match at all. Right? They couldn't put him at any of the murders. And in fact, they... They could put him at other places, which would have excluded him being able to be at the murder sites. So they had to dismiss him as a suspect. Now we get Gibbs to the main suspect that we've kind of been talking about, right? So there's not a ton of suspects that are known, even though we know the police interviewed a lot of people and probably had a lot of persons of interest, right? That's a term they like to use a lot. So the main suspect that we've been kind of hinting around about Gibbs was a man by the name of Erno Soto. And on May 25th, 1974, so this is after all the murder victims that we've talked about, Soto was apprehended during the attempted abduction of a nine-year-old Puerto Rican boy. So that could be important, could not be based on what I've previously said. But the other thing about Soto was that he was a patient at the Manhattan State Hospital and had been released just a few months before this attempted abduction. The boy escaped and he ran down the street yelling, which is what you should do, right? That's the best thing you can do. Scream fire, fire, fire. Scream, yell. And what happened was there was a bunch of citizens that actually detained Soto until the police could get there. There's some information that's known about Soto. And one of the things is he was in and out of Manhattan's mental institutions a whole lot. He had been institutionalized all the way back from 1969 intermittently, right? Like we said, in and out. He had been separated from his wife for a few years, but he wanted to reconcile with his wife and he tried to do that. But what he discovered as he was trying this reconciliation, that while he was gone, his wife had conceived a black child and they were both Puerto Rican. So Gibbs, we have to mention this because it does go back to my theory which is the perpetrator was targeting, you know, African American boys. Yeah. And this could be the reason why. This could be. I mean, if you're trying to put all the pieces together. And I have to imagine that 
the police learning of all of these facts, they're putting it together just like we're saying. But that's not the end of it. Because even though Soto knew this child wasn't his, he raised the child. But starting around the boy's eighth birthday. Magic number. Yeah, we, we got to talk about that because most of these kids were in the age range of eight, nine. But what happened around this time is he, his behavior started to grow very erratic. And this is when he was first committed to the state hospital. So, you know, this is like 69 and his mental state just continued to deteriorate. Like we said, he was in and out of the state hospital many times over the years. And what they said most of it was around was uncontrollable violence. And he was also arrested for robbery and possession of drugs, mainly heroin. So, I mean, he he was definitely had some troubles in his past. Yeah, and I think that although it doesn't tie him directly, he had some brushes with the law. Another very important thing is that Soto's physical description matched up with that description that was given by the witnesses we talked about. So this guy's got a lot of things going against him right now. Two other important points. One is that the main exit of the state hospital that he was in and out of was very close to the place where some of the boys' bodies were found. If we go back to what we were saying earlier... It was mentioned that he either escaped or had like a weekend pass to get out of there. They really weren't sure with their records what it was, but they know that he did leave the building. Right. So he had opportunity. Absolutely. Because he was known to have been outside of the hospital when these murders occurred. Yes. And I think that's very important. And then number two... Soto had some relatives that lived near where some of the other bodies were found. So Soto was arrested and a witness would come forward to the police and state that he had seen Soto with Stephen Cropper on the day he was murdered. So that's key. That's a big deal. And then you have the boy that survived... We don't know his name because they never said his name, but the boy that survived was shown Soto in a lineup, but he was not able to identify him. But that doesn't shock me, Gibbs, because we talked about it when we talked about this unnamed boy that survived. He suffered such a trauma that he could only give a very vague description. I'm not even sure how much of this person's face he even saw. He was just hanging on to life, man. Right. I mean, the fact that he even remembered what the guy used as his name, right? He's the one that said that the guy used the name Michael and that he tried to lure him with 50 cents. But he did say that Soto looked similar. He couldn't say that for sure it was him, but he did say he looked similar to the man that had attacked him. Now, there was a whole bunch of stuff that would come out about Soto, right? He ends up confessing to police that he did stalk young African-American boys in the neighborhood. And he even confesses to killing Stephen Cropper, but he won't confess to killing any of the other boys. Now, we did talk about it, Gibbs, right? The Stephen Cropper murder was different, a little bit different from the other ones. There was no genital mutilation. But what's strange about that to me is that there, you know, allegedly Soto told the police that God told him to make little boys into little girls. So how do you do that? I think we know how he thought you should do that. Right. By removing their genitals. Yep. So the state hospital comes back into play here, Gibbs, because going back through their records, they were able to figure out that he was institutionalized on the date that Stephen Cropper was murdered. So basically they're providing him with an alibi, the state hospital, but we know that they have already said he slipped in and out sometimes, but later on Gibbs, 
the state hospital would come back and say that on the day that Stephen Cropper was murdered, Mr. Soto had a weekend pass. They kind of flip-flopped, right? Yes. Initially, they said they basically provided an alibi for him. And then later on, they would come out and say they thought he had a weekend pass. Yeah, so I had a... so I have a feeling this place was really not managed very well because or they were covering their ass, cover their ass. Yeah. One way, you know, yeah. or both. So I think Gibbs at this point, the police are pretty sure that they got the right guy so much so that they charge Soto with the murder of Steven Cropper, but they don't charge him with any of the other murders. And then you get to the trial and this is probably not a stretch given the fact of, how much time Soto spent in and out of the state mental hospital, he's diagnosed with schizophrenia and ultimately he's found not guilty by reason of insanity for the murder of Stephen Cropper. Now there was a psychiatrist at trial who evaluated Soto. What came out of that evaluation was that he was, and these are quotes, a walking time bomb. And he goes on to say that this man is in need of constant surveillance. And then there had another psychiatrist that testified that said that although Soto was pleasant and cooperative during the evaluation, ultimately they determined that he was a dangerous schizophrenic who attacked for religious or ritualistic purposes But it doesn't matter, Gibbs. The bottom line is he was acquitted in the murder of Stephen Cropper, found not guilty, but he was remanded to a high security mental institution. So Gibbs, this case actually made it all the way to the state Supreme Court and Mr. Soto was acquitted there. And the judge that presided over that trial would later come out and say that, you know, he was bound by the law, right? He had to follow the law in this case, but he goes on to say the law should be changed. And and I believe this refers to the fact that he thought that there were too many acquittals that were based on this not guilty by reason of insanity defense. And he just didn't agree that this, was being applied correctly. There was another man that was actually a state commissioner. He would come out and give his opinion on this as well. And what he said is he thought there should be two different determinations at this type of trial, right? Where somebody is pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. One determination solely based on the evidence in the case and whether the defendant is guilty of the crime. And then a second that is based on the psychiatrist's advice on sentencing, which I kind of think makes a lot of sense. If you committed the crime, you committed the crime. Right. And you should be found guilty if you did. Now, if you want to say that the person was, you know, legally insane or whatever you want to call it, and then you want to have, a psychiatrist or a group of psychiatrists weigh in on what should happen, you know, whether the person should spend X amount of years confined to a state hospital or something like that. That does seem to make a lot more sense. But at least the guilty verdict stays on their record, right? Right. And they don't walk away. They don't walk away. Yeah. I mean, basically what happened in this case is he was remanded to this high security mental institution, but he can be released. He's not a criminal, right? He's a patient and he can be released when it's determined that he's no longer dangerous, which in the past, he clearly represented that if they allowed him out of this local mental home. Well, yeah, I think this is a little different, a little harder, a little harder, but still, how do you determine that somebody's no longer dangerous? I think that's always a tough, a tough thing to do. That cannot sit well with some people that the man is technically not a criminal. 
he's a patient. And when the patient is well, he'll be allowed to leave. Now, one thing that's very important to point out is after Soto is institutionalized, there are no more murders that fit this same pattern. That's a red flag for me. Yeah, I think it is. We're not saying that Soto is guilty of the Charlie Chopoff murders because we can't. He wasn't found guilty of those. But it is very interesting, Gibbs, that there's not another one like that after he's institutionalized. Now, is that because it was him? Or is that because it was somebody else, but they figured, you know, I better stop now while I'm ahead because everybody thinks it's this guy. Yeah, but from some cases that we've done in the past, their ego typically doesn't allow them to stop. If it allows them to stop, it's very short-lived, right? It might might be a year, could be a few years, but eventually they're back at it again. But even though we consider, and everybody considers, the Charlie Chopoff murders unsolved, I do believe that the police think that they had their guy. I don't know. What what do you think, Gibbs? Yeah, I think they feel pretty comfortable with what they have. I mean, clearly they can't close it out, but I don't think they're paying any attention to it. Because the only other explanation, and it could be valid, is that Soto really did murder only Stephen Cropper, and you had a completely independent person some other person that murdered all the rest of the people, all the rest of the boys. Possibility. But for whatever reason, they decided to stop. Or they died or they got locked up or... Well, that's the whatever reason yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> that's part of the whatever Whatever. Reason. I mean, they... that that's really the only two... Scenarios? Scenarios that I can think of. It's always interesting. I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting case and it's a different type of unsolved for us because you have a person that they know killed one of the individuals. And like we said, the murder characteristics were a little different than the rest, but some of the things that the guy said, I've got a voice or somebody telling me I need to turn boys into girls. We talked about the fact that, you know, his wife had a a baby that was African American his mental state started to deteriorate around. Yeah. Just before the first murder. Well, and also at the age when this baby or not baby, but when it became eight or nine years old and it just so happens that all the, the boys that are targeted are right around that same age. Same age. Yeah. I mean, all that stuff just makes it very interesting. All right, Gibbs. So that's the case of, Charlie Chopoff, another episode of True Crime All the Time Unsolved. So for Mike and Gibby, stay safe and keep your own time ticking.